All right, hey, good morning, RCC. It's so great to see you. I'm gonna invite us to stand to our feet. We're gonna sing of the redemption we have in Christ. Let's worship together.
Good morning, RCC. You may be seated. We are thrilled that you're with us today. Uh, if you are joining us online, we want to extend a very special welcome to you as well, and thank you for joining us also. We want to ask that you do us a huge favor, whether you're online or in person. If you would fill out one of our Connect cards, you can find that in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, you can also scan the QR code and complete the Connect card that way. Uh, but this is just an excellent way for you to get to know us uh, and us to get to know you. There are so many amazing things that are taking place in this church on a daily basis. Um, we want you to be a part of those. We also need you to be a part of those. Uh, also, we want to let you know we count it a privilege and an honor and a blessing to be able to pray with you and to be able to pray for you. Every single week, the leadership team receives your prayer request, uh, and we do take time on a daily basis to be praying with you guys. And so you can also use these Connect cards um, to write down any prayer requests that you have. You can put these requests uh, in the giving boxes as you exit. And RCC, we also want to thank you uh, on behalf of everyone on our leadership team for being a community of faith that takes giving seriously. We believe that giving is an expression, an extension of our faith in the Lord. And you all do a phenomenal job with this. We have several ways to give that you can see on the screen behind me. But we want to thank you in advance for all of the ways that you sacrificially give that make this community, but also make this world a better place, a place that reaches out to make disciples of all peoples. And with that being said, with and through your giving, God is doing many, many phenomenal things here. And one of those things that he uh, has empowered us and enabled us to do is to hire staff. And so I'm going to ask some of my very dear friends and colleagues to come and join me on the stage at this time. And so please give a warm welcome to people that you know very well, Maureen, JB, Kaylee, and Nathan. Now, I can't say in first service that they don't have a clue um, why they are up here because first service uh, let the cat, of, cat out of the bag in that regard. Um, but each one of them has been here at RCC serving on staff for more than five years. Uh, but today, we want to say a special thank you to each of them and highlight each of them uh, and let them know how much they're loved and appreciated and valued by us. This is their happy five-year anniversary. And so at this time, I'm going to ask, yes, give it up for them, that for sure. And at this time, we have some very special gifts as a small token of our appreciation for you guys. So if you can make your way up here and bring those gifts. And as they are receiving the gifts that, um, that they're being given on behalf of all of us at RCC, I want to highlight 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, references that disciples of Jesus are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, ambassadors in their own context, and also ambassadors in the world. And these four individuals are tremendous, tremendous ambassadors. Yes, they have a job here to do at RCC, but I know I can speak for every single one of them in, say, in saying that they count this as more than a job. They count this as a huge blessing. It's a big part of who they are on a daily basis. And so we want to say thank you. And if you're able, I just want you guys to reach out a hand or extend both hands as we pray over them and pray over their families. Father in heaven, thank you so very much, Lord. First of all, for your church. Father, the design of your church is perfect and it is beautiful. And Father, you have designed your church to be the agency through which the world is reached for you. And so, Father, help us to know that every single person has a role in being your church. It's not just those on staff. It's not just those who hold titles of leadership. Father, every one of us is a part of the body. And Father, I want to thank you for these four up here for Maureen, JB, Kaylee, and Nathan, for all their years of service here at RCC and hopefully for many more years of service. Father, help us to love them well. Help us to encourage them to hold their hands up, to hold their hearts up. Father, they do that for each one of us 
and so many more that we have no idea about. So Father, as we celebrate them, most importantly, help us to celebrate you and the work that you are able to do and the work that you're doing, not only in this community locally, but Father, in your church worldwide. We give you the rest of this time and thank you so very much for it. We ask all these things through the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Hey, church, we're going to turn to a time of communion. And if you didn't receive the elements as you came in, just go ahead and raise your hand. And we have ushers, leaders across the room. They'll, they'll bring those to you. Just keep your hand raised so they can see you. And as we enter into this time of communion, you know, we just, uh, we just got done singing a song called Living Hope. And it's speaking to the hope that we have in Christ. But, you know, the Bible says, church, that without the resurrection that we have no hope. In fact, the Bible says that without the resurrection that our faith is meaningless. And everything that we celebrate in hope is because we know the truth of the resurrection, that Jesus, he took the weight of our sin upon himself. He went to the cross and he died there. And then he was raised again in three days. And because of that resurrection, church, you, me, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord has hope in eternal life. And that's why we come together as the church, as the body, and that's why we celebrate and give praise to God. And that night when Jesus broke bread and, and gave this illustration of his body as a sacrifice to his disciples, they didn't know exactly what was going on, but he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the wine, he said, drink, do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood poured out for you. And so when we take communion, church, we're not just sitting in remembrance and reflecting of what Christ did for us on the cross, but we celebrate in hope because we have a risen and alive Savior in this room right now. In fact, the Bible says when you don't even know what to pray, that the Spirit intercedes for you and prays for you. And whatever your season, whatever your circumstance, can we encourage you to rest in the living hope that we have in Christ? Because I promise you, and the Bible reinstates it, that the things that we experience are gonna have no comparison to the eternal glory that we share with Christ, amen? Amen. That's our hope. It is alive and it is well. And because of that, it manifests into an expression of praise, which is what we're going to do here in just a moment. But I want to pray. I want to invite you to take communion together as a family, and then we're going to continue worshiping the Lord. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the hope that we have in you, Jesus, because you gave your life for us. Lord, as the sacrifice, as the atonement. God, you have reconciled us back to you through your son, Jesus. And God, that's our hope. That's what we celebrate. That's why we're here. And Lord, as we celebrate through song, as we celebrate recognizing, Lord, people who you have empowered and equipped and putting here like the staff and so many other people, God, so many other people who, who work towards the forward movement of what you're doing here. And God, as we begin to preach your word, Lord, I pray all of it is nothing for our own gain, but it's for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, for the edification of your church. Remind us of that truth this morning, God. We commit ourselves to you. We give our praise to you. And Lord, we have expectant hearts because we know that you are constant, you are unchanging, and you are a wonderful, amazing Savior. God, we rest in that this morning. We give you the praise in Jesus' name.
before you sit, welcome everyone online. Welcome all our brothers and sisters online this morning. We love you guys. So glad to have you. Amen. Please be seated. My name is Nathan, one of the pastors here at RCC. I want to welcome you. Just like Pastor Anthony said, it's your first time here. Come by and see us at the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you, and we would love uh, to give that to you. So please come by and say hi to his first time guest. Um, we want to welcome you, and I, I want to start today by talking about something that's really important. And that is, um, yesterday, let me kind of tell you a little bit what happened yesterday. I took my uh, two sons, my wife is out of town, my daughter's in college, so it was just us boys <laughs> at the house. And I decided, you know, let's just go have a little uh, father and son time and went to the beach and had a, had a great, great time together. But while we were there, a young man from Clay County drove 30 minutes north and killed three people because of the color of their skin. And I did not know that until about 9.30 last night. And when I found out about it, and those of you who know me well, I'm just not much of a crier, but I could not stop crying. Just heartbroken. Heartbroken that, um, you know, we as a church, and I'm not just saying RCC, but churches, big C church all around the world, but specifically here in Northeast Florida, we have a message that could change the tide for young men like this man. And his name is Jesus. And that's our job is to get Jesus out to people so this kind of senseless hate will finally stop. And I couldn't help but just feel that responsibility more than ever to make sure people heard about Jesus so that prejudice and racism will finally cease. And that's the only way it's going to stop, church. You can't, govern, you can't do government programs for this. and You can't educate enough for this. This comes down to Jesus transforming our world. And we have that message. And so I, I felt that responsibility like I never had before last night because he came out of, our, out of our county. But the other side of this is the heartbreak for the families who just 24 hours ago, just 24 hours ago right here, right now, they were alive and well and now they're dead and gone forever. And my heart breaks for that family. My heart breaks for the community of people who are scared, who are confused, who are sad, who are angry. And so my heart wants to just stop for a moment and just have a moment of silence for those families and pray. I reached out to a friend of mine who's a pastor in that community just five minutes away. I went to his church when I was uh, taking a break for three weeks. And I, one of the churches I went to was his church. And it was, it was amazing. We walked in there and it was pretty obvious that we were there because we were the only white people in the church. So it was pretty obvious we were there. But I want you to know, I, I've been to a lot of churches in my few decades on this planet. I have never ever, ever, and my wife would say the same thing, and my daughter would say the same thing, I have never been more welcomed in my life like I was in that moment. Never been probably loved on by church like I was at my friend's church. And I kept thinking if, my, if this young man would have gone with me and my family that day, he would experience the same love of Jesus, and it would have changed him. That's the only way this is going to change is the love of Jesus Christ. I reached out to my friend. I said, is everybody in your, your church okay? And he said, uh, we've checked on as many people as we could. And as far as we know, everybody's safe and sound. So I praise God for that. But our heart still aches for those who lost loved ones. So right now, I want you to have a moment of silence. I just want you to pray for the families who lost loved ones. I want you to pray for our community. I want you to pray for the family whose son went and did this incredible evil thing and how much heartbreak they must be having today. I want you to pray for the church. They will rise up and will continue to change the world on behalf of Jesus Christ. So let's just have a moment of silence and I'll pick up and pray in just in a second. Let's spend time with God right now. Lord, your word says you're close to the brokenhearted. And Lord, we know you were close to people this morning. 
people who cannot believe. They're, they're, they're hoping to wake up this morning and just think it was a nightmare, but it's not. It really happened. And Lord, as they're grieving that, as we're grieving that with them, Lord, I pray that in that grief you will rise up, Lord, a conviction to spread Jesus to everyone we know. Lord, that you will bring healing to those who need healing. You will bring comfort, Lord, that you will, you will shoot light in such a dark world that we live in. Lord, that you will, you will bring reconciliation like you always have where things are so broken. And Lord, that hope will rise up because, Lord, we lift up Jesus together. Lord, he is the only one that can bind us together. Different races and different backgrounds and different languages and different perspectives. Lord, the one thing that's going to unite us is truly Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray, Lord, we will continue to lift him up. And Lord, we get away of all egos and, Lord, all false ideologies. And Lord, we will love people because they are made in your image. Lord, I pray that the church will rise up and lead the way here. Lord, I pray that you will use every single one of us to bring the only thing that can truly change anybody, and that's the message of the gospel. And Lord, not only will we say it, but we will live it out. And Lord, we will be influencers. Lord, we will be the genesis of ending racism and prejudice. Lord, all I can say right now is come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray this all in his name. And the whole church said, amen. We're in a series right now called One Month to Live. And we talked about four principles that God wants us to live by so that we live a life with no regrets. And when you ask people within their life what they regret, you'll hear things like this, that they wish they would love more deeply, that they would give it more generously, that they would laugh more often, and that they would have lived more boldly. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about leaving a legacy because many of us are going through the same old, same old life. We're thinking it's not that big of a deal. But what you're doing with every single one of your choices is you are leaving a legacy. And that legacy you leave, you, you're either going to give is something that's just going to wipe away after you die, or it will continue on long after you die. It all depends on the materials in which you use to build your life. You are building a life. You're building a, a construction. And it all depends on the materials you use, the quality of the materials you use. Then Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says this, If any man builds on this foundation, Jesus Christ is the foundation, using gold, silver, costly stones, or something cheap like wood, hay, or straw. Obviously, there's a difference in the building materials, right? His work will be shown for what it is because the day, the day that Jesus comes to settle everything, will be brought to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will testify, test the, the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. And this passage says that every single day, you and I are building a legacy. Every moment of every day, I get to choose which material I'm going to build that legacy with. I can use temporary materials or I can use eternal materials. And if I'm going to build a lasting legacy, there's primary materials that I need to use. And so today I want to talk to you about those materials. Number one is this, and that is convictions. Convictions. Convictions are the core values from God's word that never change. Convictions, true convictions, are eternal. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8 says this, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God, say it with me church, does what? Stands forever. You see, trends and styles come and go, but the word of God does what? Stands forever. Pop psychology is always changing, but the word of God does what? stands forever. Scientific theory is always changing, but the Word of God stands forever because the Word of God is truth. Is it truth today? Is it truth thousands of years ago? It'll be truth thousands of years from now if Jesus hasn't come back. My convictions have got to come from the Word of God. My core values of God's Word never change. They are rock-solid foundation in a very shaky world, but I have to live them out for them to be convictions. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of it, 
He talks about people who take his teachings and actually apply them to their life. He says it's like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. But the person who hears the words of Jesus but doesn't apply them, well, here's what Jesus says about them from the message translation. He says, but if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you're like a, what, stupid carpenter. A stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. And Jesus is saying, don't just study the Bible. You've got to apply it for it to be a conviction. Because if you don't, if you don't really believe something, unless you actually live it out. In fact, another way of saying is this. We only believe the parts of the Bible that we apply. Do you only believe the parts of the Bible that you apply? That's a conviction. Now, I want to talk to you about three different types of convictions so you understand what we're getting at here. Number one conviction is what's called public convictions. It's this. It's what I say I believe. Public convictions are what I want people to think I believe, even though I may not actually believe them. I say them because I'm trying to manage your impression of me. An example of this in the Bible is King Herod. King Herod hears from the Magi that the Christ, the Son of God, uh, the Messiah has been born. And, and they say, we come from the Far East and we come to worship the, the, the King of the Jews. Well, then King Herod, he says this, he says to the Magi, hey, well, go do a careful search for him, and if you find him, let me know so I can go and worship him. Question, did Herod really want to worship Jesus? No. That's just public. That's just a public conviction. He is managing their impression of him. He's appearing to be sincere. Stephen Colbert called it truthiness is what he calls it. It's, it's a meaning that it may not be true, but it sounds true, Right? That's public convictions. The second one is this, and that is what we call private convictions. This is what I think I believe. I sincerely think I believe them, but when circumstances change and turn against me, I find out that it's not really a belief like I thought it was a belief. Our man from last week, Peter's a good example of this. He goes to Jesus, he says, you know what, Jesus, if everyone else denies you, I won't. I won't deny you. Question. Did Peter believe that? Did he believe what he said? I think he did. Absolutely he believed it. But all of a sudden the circumstances changed and all of a sudden that conviction wasn't quite as settled inside of Peter as he thought it was. Private convictions are what I think I believe, but sometimes they really aren't. And the last one is this one. That is core convictions. This is what we're going for. Core convictions, what I reveal, I really do believe by my actions. You see, core convictions are revealed by daily actions, what we actually do. This is a place where the inner, you know, inside secret beliefs show themselves to us in those moments when we're surprised by our reactions, we're surprised by our behaviors, by our postures. See, a belief is something that you hold, a conviction is something that holds you. A belief is something that you debate about and you argue about. A conviction is something you die for. When, when what I say I believe and what I think I believe are revealed by my actions, that's a conviction. And if you're going to build a lasting legacy, you have to build convictions in your life that are not based on polls or popular opinions or expert advice. They must be based on the unchanging rock of God's word. And parents, we're going to have to build in our kids a lasting legacy. We've got to build in their lives at deep convictions that they will carry with them after they leave our homes. In fact, I would put it this way. I, I didn't have children. My wife and I didn't have children so we could kind of, you know, segregate them from the world and isolate them and form like a little cult, you know. That's not our job. Our job is prepare them with convictions and then unleash them into the world to change the world on behalf of Jesus Christ. That's why I have children, to expand the kingdom of God. I want them to have core convictions, and they're like missionaries everywhere they go to be light in this dark world. Where does that come from? It comes from convictions. I think of a little girl who had convictions. She's getting out of Bible study you know, on a sunny morning, and the preacher walks by and sees her. She's got a book in her hands, and he asks her, what's the book you have in your hands? And she says, oh, it's my, it's my study book. It's called Jonah and the Big Fish. And uh, the preacher's feeling mischievous, 
And he says to her, he says, okay, so tell me something. Do you really believe Jonah, a grown man, could be swallowed up by a big fish and be okay? Do you believe that? And the little girl said, of course I believe it. And the preacher said, okay, can you prove to me that that story is true? And the little girl thought for a moment. She says, you know, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. (laughs) And then the preacher said, well, what if Jonah is not in heaven? And the little girl put her hands on her hips and looked at the preacher and says, well, you ask him. (laughs) That little girl's got convictions right there. And that smart like preacher got what he deserved. So that's what's going on. We got to build our, our legacy on these convictions. Here's the second building material, and that is character. Character, write that down. God cares about my character because when you die, when I die, you don't take anything with you except your character, who you are. In fact, Paul says this, God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who, what, love him along the same lines as the what? the life of his son. See, that's what God is doing. He is trying to shape in you a character that's based on Jesus. He wants your character and Jesus' character to be more alike as you grow in the Lord. William Woodfin put it this way, the proof of Christianity is not a book, but a life. The power of Christianity is not a creed, but what? Christian character. Whenever you see a life that's been transformed by the grace of God, you see a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. That's the power of character. There's a great story about the sculptor Michelangelo. Someone came to him and asked him one time, how did you sculpt the famous sculpture of David? And he said, well, that's easy. I just chipped away everything that did not look like David. And that's what God is doing in your life. He's chipping away everything in your life that does not look like Jesus Christ. Well, how does he do it? What tools does he use to chip away and make my character more like Jesus Christ? Well, the first tool I want to talk about that he uses is the word problems. Problems. He uses problems to chip away things that don't look like Jesus in my life. And by the way, if you have a pulse, you've got a problem, right? you got a pulse, you've got a problem. See, see, sometimes God allows little problems in my life to kind of rub those rough edges off that need to look more like Jesus. And other times, he takes big chunks out of my character out. He's trying to refine me huge ways with big problems, like a jackhammer, to make me more like Christ. And I can always come more like Christ, no matter what the problem is, if I have the right, humble attitude. Someone said this, to become long-suffering, one has to be long-bothered. The second tool that God uses to chisel away to make us more like Christ is pressures. Pressures. You know, that's where we learn patience is pressures. The most Christ-like people I've known are people who've gone through tremendous amount of pressure. Situations that squeeze them revealed out, revealed the inside came out of how much they relied on God. For instance, when pressure comes, you have a choice. Do I, do I just rely on God? God, I need your help here. God, I need you. I need you to redeem the situation. I need you to make me more into the man or woman of God. Or do you, in the moment of pressure, get in the way and insist on doing it your way? And when you do that, what happens is things start crumbling around you. And sometimes you're so blinded by pride, you don't even see it. And the third tool that God uses to make us more like Christ is this other P, and that is people. God uses people as a tool to chip away the rough spots in my character. Every one of us has some people in our lives that are kind of hard to love. Amen? All right, there's like me and five other people that understand this. All right. They irritate us. They get on our skin. They rub us the wrong way. Some of you, some of you have it in your family. They're like heavily sandpaper, right, rubbing those areas of your life that need to look more like Jesus Christ. Don't point at them, all right? I don't want any problems here. One poet said, to live above with saints we love, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, that's another story, right? So God uses problems, pressures, people to make us more like Jesus so we can leave a lasting legacy. And the last one, building material I want to talk about with you this morning is this one. It is community. God's community, guess what, will last forever. 
It's going to last forever. That's why it's so important to build relationships with other believers. People that are going the right direction. It doesn't mean that they have it all together. But it means they're striving in a godly direction. So my question to you is this. Why don't you join them? Why don't you join them? I want to encourage you to join a life group. We talked about this last week. And you need to do everything you can to be a part of this. And I believe this, what I'm about to say. If you're too busy for a life group, you're too busy. If you're too busy to be part of a life group, you're too busy. I believe that. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for life groups in my life. Do you, do you remember those two sisters in the Bible, Mary and Martha, the good friends with Jesus? And, and Jesus is coming over to spend time with them. In fact, they're going to host Jesus. And Martha, when she hears this, she breaks out in a frenzy. And some of you are living a life like that right now. Your just life is total frenzy, trying to make everything perfect because Jesus is coming over the house. And I just want to say this, every church needs a Martha. Erase that. Every church needs thousands of Marthas. That's what we need. Their sleeves are rolled up. They keep the pace of the church because of Marthas. The, the church's budget gets balanced and the, and the babies get bounced and the, and the church's buildings get built. And, and, and we need to appreciate Marthas. Marthas are energizer bunnies of the church. They store strength and energy like camels store water. But Marthas have a weakness, and their weakness is their tendency to elevate the mission over the master. And so, so Jesus comes over for dinner one night with his 12 disciples, and the scene that Luke describes is this. Mary, Sister Mary, is seated, but Martha, she's seating. You see the difference? And Martha's not happy about it. She's angry because Mary is horror of horrors sitting at the feet of Jesus. How impractical, how irrelevant, how unnecessary. And so Martha complains, all right, and here's what she says. Martha was distracted by her, what, many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, read it with me, Lord, do you not care? You hear it in her voice? Do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. All of a sudden, Martha has gone from serving Jesus to now making demands of Jesus. And, and the room falls silent, right? And Mary's face flushes red with embarrassment. And then Jesus says these words, Martha, Martha. By the way, if Jesus ever says your name twice, brace yourself. <laughs> you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, Martha. Indeed, actually, let's just simplify this, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, understand, Martha's trying to be a blessing. She really is. The problem was she was so, she's allowed the momentary busyness of life to distract her from the main business of life, which is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so Jesus kindly and yet directly rebukes Martha, saying, Martha, you have missed the mark on this one. Mary is doing what is important. You're doing what is urgent, and those two things are different. What's important and what's urgent are not the same things. Follow me is actually really simple is what he's saying. What matters most is a relationship with me and a relationship with others in the community of Jesus followers. It's dumbfounding to me that when life gets busy, that Christian community is the thing that Christians are first to bump out of their lives. I wouldn't say it's dumbfounding, it breaks my heart. Because when life gets stressful, and life gets busy, and life gets difficult, newsflash, that's the truth for everybody. Christian community is what we should run towards. We should run towards Christian community. And family, I believe that if you only had one month to live, the choice to focus on Jesus and the followers of Jesus would be clearer to see and easier to engage in if you really only had one month to live. I really believe that. Hence why we've been asking this drastically clarifying question. What if I learned I only had one month to live? We've asked you to sit at the feet of Jesus this month. Many of you have talked about the daily devotionals you're receiving. In fact, I was in a restaurant and some guy from another church came to me and said, thank you for those daily devotionals. Somebody from your church is sending them to me. And I think that's pretty amazing. 
And so we challenge you to go to God, spend time alone with Him, share it with others. Because most of the material stuff that we're so, we're so obsessed with, that we're so trying to get and we're trying to keep the material stuff that so many of us right now we're so anxious about, I just want you to know, after we die, we leave it all behind. We leave all that behind. Amazingly, after we leave it, it doesn't last much longer anyway. I have never, ever seen a, a hearse dragging a U-Haul. I've never seen that. Because you don't take it with you. See, when we're gone, our money will be spent probably by people we don't even like and in ways we don't approve of. You know, the executive, uh, executive who works from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day, he will be wildly successful and will be fondly remembered by his wife's next husband. Our homes, our property are going to deteriorate. They'll be sold. Our personal belongings will, will be items in an antique store. I ran across an antique store with this title right here. They call themselves dead people stuff. <laughs> Who would shop there? You weirdo. Some of you would, all right? Anyway, there's a book out there entitled Dead Warmed Over. It's a combination of cookbook and a social economic study of funeral meals and rituals. And the author starts the book off by talking about a terminally ill man who's dying at home in his bed. And while he is dying, he smells his favorite smell, and that is chocolate chip cookies being, being cooked. And he wanted one last cookie. That's all he wanted, one last cookie. And so he kind of fell out of bed, and he crawled, his old frail body crawled all the way to the kitchen. He got to the oven, and from the ground, he lifts up, and his hand's trembling, and he reaches over to grab one last cookie. And right when he's about to touch it, he feels a sting of a spatula on the back of his hand, and his wife says, put that back, they're for the funeral. Because here's the moral of the story. Somebody else is going to eat our cookies, okay? You need to know that. <laughs> Family, if we build our lives on the convictions rooted in Scripture and if our character is shaped by Jesus Christ and we live in community of people who are bonded by that common faith, then we will have ex experienced and established an eternal legacy that will live on after we're gone and it will echo for an eternity. That's what I want. Every one of us wants to leave a legacy. And so as we close out this one month to live, it seemed good to encourage you to make a decision to move forward. You need to know a core principle of RCC comes out of Matthew 16. When Jesus looks at Peter and the disciples, he says, who do you guys say I am? And Peter, convicted by God, says these words. He says, you, Jesus, are the Messiah, the son of the what? The living God. That's a core conviction of RCC. So I'm going to ask you. If you have believed that, if you believe that statement and you've never made that proclamation, we're going to give you a moment to do that. And I'm praying that you'll take that belief and you'll marry it with an action so it becomes a conviction and that you will experience an immersion of baptism. You'll be baptized the way that Jesus was baptized, that you will be baptized the way that the, the, the apostles from the New Testament would baptize people, that you would merge that belief with an action so it becomes a conviction. Maybe today you realize, you know what, I, I, have, I am a believer, I have been baptized, but I'm not involved in a local church family. I want to encourage you to go welcome to RCC next week. It's at 10 a.m., so come to 8.30, come to 11.30, so you can be there at the 10 a.m. You can leave your kids in both times, all right? We'll take care of you. We won't charge extra, all right? But I encourage you to go to that so you can know more about how to be part of the local church. Take that belief and marry it with an action so it becomes a conviction. Maybe what you need to do is join a life group. You're part of this church, but you're not in a life group right now. You, you need to be a part of a church family of believers. I'm telling you, they're going to be there for you like you never, ever could imagine. Or maybe you need to use your gifts that God's given you. By the way, they're not really your gifts or God's gifts to help expand the kingdom of God. I need to be involved in ministry here. T take that belief and marry it with an action so it becomes a conviction. Will you stand with me right now? Please stand. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me the statement of faith, and I want you to say it like a lion, all right? Let's say it like lions. Just repeat after me. I believe, I believe Jesus, is the Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the, of the, living God 
my Savior and Lord. Can we give God the praise, church? Let's give him praise. I pray you commit to that conviction that forms a Christian character in you as you bond the community of Christ followers. God allows us to leave a legacy that is greater, that is higher, that is broader that is deeper than we could ever imagine if we'll build our life with the right materials. In this series, we've been asking and saying this statement, you're not ready to live unless you're ready to leave. I don't want you to leave here today until you know that your belief is married with an action so it becomes a conviction. We talked about leaving boldly, and let me ask you today, that I wish so bad I could have asked those people in the Dollar General before they walked in that, that store. If you died today, would you leave boldly in Jesus Christ? If you died today, would you leave boldly in Jesus Christ? And my prayer is for every one of you and every one of you online, you would say, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Let me pray over you. Father, we come before you, and Lord, there's a lie that we believe, and that is that we think we have a lot of time. And the reality is, Lord, we don't. Lord, I pray in the series that you convicted us to think of things eternally. Lord, understanding that, Lord, time is of the essence. And so, Lord, there'll be urgency in our soul right now to make things right with you by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and receive him as our Lord and as our Savior. And not only just keeping it there, but, Lord, but to live it out so there's conviction. Lord, I pray for every one of us right now that the Holy Spirit will convict us in what we should do next to move forward in our walk with you. Lord, for those who don't believe, Lord, I pray, Lord, they will wake up to the purpose and the life and the hope and the forgiveness that you offered them through Jesus Christ. And may they know we are so honored to have them in our life. But, Lord, we want to be known as Jesus' people. Lord, a force of unity, a force that reconciles, a force that tells people the truth about why they have breath in their lungs. Lord, thank you so much for giving us this purpose, giving us this mission, all because of our master, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So if we can be a blessing to you, our prayer team is up here, and they would be honored to pray for you about whatever it is. Maybe you just want to pray by yourself. You can come up here and just bow your head. Just have a moment with the Lord. Maybe today you want to give your life to Jesus Christ or share a joy, whatever it is. But once you come as we worship this great God that just gives us hope and gives us life through Jesus Christ, amen. Can we give him glory right now? Please come as we worship together. Yo. Yeah. 
Amen, amen. Hey, well, RCC, we are so grateful that you are here today joining with us. And if you joined with us online, thank you so much. We pray that today has been a blessing for you. As you make your way out, don't forget we have our life group tables out there. Go and visit that. And then also we have decals. We have magnets and decals you can put on your car. And the idea is just to put RCC out in our community, okay? And so we love you. Go be a blessing to others around you. And we will see you next week.